Hi, everyone. I think we're going to go ahead and get started. My name is Akila Gant. I'm the current president of the New York East, also known as the Williams Metro New York Regional Alumni Association. That's a mouthful, so we just prefer to go by New York East. And on behalf of the association and the Alumni Relations Office, I would like to welcome you and to thank you for joining the final installment of this virtual summer faculty lecture series. These one hour virtual lecture series um, events were scheduled every three weeks over the past summer and have featured Williams professors from a, from a variety of academic fields, including but not limited to music, geosciences, and political science. You can find the recordings of past talks in this lecture series as well as other Williams offerings at alumni.williams.edu slash virtual. Be on the lookout for announcements about a variety of virtual events in the near future, including a new slate of faculty, faculty talks resuming later this fall. So before we jump into formal introductions, I just wanted to take a moment to speak from a personal space in the hopes that it might acknowledge and reflect what others might be bringing into this space today. We all know this year has been beyond challenging. We've been separated from loved ones, worried for our health and theirs. We've witnessed horrors perpetrated against human life. We've witnessed protests, and maybe we put our own bodies on the line in the streets calling for justice. And then the first official response to one of those calls for justice just yesterday, we received a response that is beyond disappointing. Please forgive me for the words that I've chosen. I think they pale in comparison to the sentiment, but um, I did not have the words, nor did I wanna try to find the words to capture the sentiment that I think many of us may feel at this time. I didn't have the time to process it. Um, and I don't know that I have yet. We've lost giants of public service and elders in the civil rights and women's rights movement, two of them being John Lewis and Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who we just lost last week. And we've lost one of our own, and I'd like to lift up her name, Gianna Hutton, class of 2010, who suddenly and sadly left us just last week. I did not know Gianna, but I studied abroad with her sister. And so I know her sister is absolutely devastated and my heart breaks for her and her family. And then in the midst of all of this, we have our own personal trials, challenges that we're facing, whether that might be health scares or loss of loved ones or loss of income, or if that might be inspiration or movement closer to what you find most dear. And so I just wanted to take a moment to call out those sentiments that you may be coming into this space with, whether that be weariness, I think I feel that, if it's anger, rage, disappointment, bewilderment, bafflement, frustration, numbness, a sense of loss, grief, hopefulness, energy, gratitude, determination, resolve. Whatever those sentiments may be, we acknowledge them, we honor them, and we welcome them in this space. And so we have this gift of community as we are together for this next hour. And I would encourage you, and I hope you feel encouraged, to engage with the chat function, to share your thoughts, your comments, your ideas in real time with one another so that we can take advantage of this resource that we have of one another. And I would even ask that you might start now. What are you bringing to this space today? If there was a sentiment that I missed that you are feeling, what are you feeling? If there was something that resonated with you, what was that and how so? And I would also ask if you would share in the chat What's your hope for coming to this talk today? What did you hope to take from it? What did you hope to gain from it? 
I'll share that I hope that you and we may receive something today that may plant a seed, that may restore us even for just today, or that may help us process, move in or move through whatever sentiments we might be bringing to the stage today. And so as we move through the talk, if you have any questions, particularly for Professor Roberts, please use the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen. There's no need to wait until the end to submit a question as it arises. Please just submit it using the Q&A. But keeping that separate from the chat function, please use that to engage with one another and take advantage of community. But if you have a question specifically for Professor Roberts, please use the Q&A function. And so with that, I'll move into the formal introduction. I would like to introduce our featured speaker, Professor Neil Roberts. Professor Roberts is chair and professor of Africana Studies at Williams. In addition to Africana Studies, Professor Roberts also teaches political theory and the philosophy of religion. He received a BA in Afro-American Studies and Law and Public Policy from Brown University and his MA and PhD in political science from the University of Chicago with a specialization in political theory. Professor Roberts is an active scholar and writer. His present writings deal with the intersections of Caribbean, continental, and North American political theory with respect to theorizing the concept of freedom. His most recent book, a Political Companion to Frederick Douglass was published in 2018. Roberts was president of the Caribbean Philosophical Association from 2016 through, through 2019. And since July 2018, he has served as the W. Ford Schumann Faculty Fellow in Democratic Studies. <laughs> Professor Roberts, thank you so much for joining us today. I'll turn it over to you for your talk entitled Living Free in an Age of Pessimism. Thank you very much. And can everyone see the screen? Hopefully, yes. Um, good day, everyone, wherever you are uh, in the world. Uh, I'm honored to have the opportunity to speak with you under the auspices of the Williams College Summer, or maybe it's Summer into Fall lecture series hosted by the Williams Metro New York Regional Association. So many thanks for inviting me to think and reason with you all. And thank you, uh, Akila, uh, again, for that gracious introduction. Now, let me declare up front, I am not an Afro-pessimist, whatever that means. And uh, this talk shall hopefully disclose the significance of that statement and perhaps a little, uh, perhaps a little more. Brianna Taylor. 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 My planned talk, you know, I had a nice long written document, um, some of which I will still read from, uh, was very different um, than w some of what I will uh, speak with you uh, today about. Uh, as was mentioned in the opening, um, the life of Brianna Taylor and questions of not only freedom, but also justice, justice eclipsed, justice that has not come, um, silence and disavowed black women in the United States and elsewhere, but particularly in the United States. And um, what does it mean to have a case in which a term, a legal term, wanton endangerment, right, of an officer for whom uh, has been indicted not for uh, the lethal shooting of an individual, but in essence, endangering the neighbors, endangering the air around the individual who is no longer um, with us. Uh, and yet, what do we make of um, a life 
that it may be understandable for many to be pessimistic about this outcome. Uh, and so this is really some of which I want to begin with right now. If it is asked, do we live in a pessimistic age? The answer is no, but we do live in an age of pessimism. In an age of pessimism, pessimism is not the only viewpoint humans uphold, yet it is a worldview permeating the globe to a notable extent nonetheless. Ta-Nehisi Coates expresses a form of pessimism near the beginning of Between the World and Me, the evocative book-length letter to his son in which Coates writes, but some time ago, I rejected magic in all its forms. This rejection was a gift from your grandparents who never tried to console me with ideas of an afterlife and were skeptical of preordained American glory. In accepting both the chaos of history and the fact of my total end, I was freed to truly consider how I wished to live. Specifically, how do I live free in this black body? It is a profound question because America understands itself as God's handiwork, but the black body is the clearest evidence that America is the work of men. I have asked the question through my reading and writings, through the music of my youth, through the arguments with your grandfather, your mother, your aunt Janai, your uncle Ben. I have searched for answers in nationalist myth in classrooms, out on the streets and on other continents. The question is unanswerable, which is not to say futile. The greatest reward of this constant interrogation, of confrontation with the brutality of my country, is that it has freed me from the ghosts and girded me against the sheer terror of disembodiment, and I am afraid. The terror of disembodiment haunted Sandra Bland. It haunted Trayvon Martin. It haunted Angela Davis for a crime she didn't commit, a crime whose punishment could have yielded death. It haunted Marie-Joseph Angelique, the slave accused of convicted and publicly hung for burning down a majority of old Montreal, New France. It haunted Harriet Jacobs in her grandmother's garret, a nine feet long, three feet high, seven foot wide loop, what she called a loophole of retreat. It haunted the Maroons of the Great Dismal Swamp. It haunted the Haitian revolutionaries. It haunted James Baldwin, whom Coates is often compared. Now it's understandable for the Coates of Between World and Me, who ironically would actually, the image you see, would actually edit this recent issue of Vanity Fair on Breonna Taylor. It's, it's understandable that for Coates in his, in his book, he's afraid for himself his son, his country, and this world due to the sheer terror of disembodiment, white supremacy, anti, and anti-black racism that undergird the founding of modern heron vogue polities. The political scientist Alexei de Tocqueville notes these effects in democracy in America when stating, quote, when the Negro is no longer, his bones are cast to the side and the difference of conditions is still found even in the equality of death. Furthermore, it's understandable why Coates, the pessimist, believes there are no answers to the question, how do I live free in this black body? Or how did Breonna Taylor try to live free in her black body? But I wanna suggest that Coates is wrong. There are answers to the, his question. One Coates and thinkers espousing genres of pessimism across a range of intellectual traditions failed to acknowledge or accept. The poet Audre Lorde concurred in her trenchant essay, The Transformation of Silence into Language and Action, when reflecting on the existence of individuals and groups whom others have attempted to enslave and euthanize, Lorde declared, for to survive in the mouth of this dragon we call America, we have had to learn this first and most vital lesson that we were never meant to survive. And yet, here we are still. So the topic of how to live free in an age of pessimism, within which the inquiries of 
coats and lord all pertain is a quandary, but not a paradox. My talk today and discussion with you hopes to at least try and propose a solution to this uh, impasse. Methodologically interdisciplinary, the talk draws on scholarship in black studies, philosophy, and political theory. And really it's just a, a, a short version of, a, of my latest book that's coming out soon. The field of black studies emerged in the academy in the 1960s in response to student movements, black metamorphoses, legitimation crises, and the rethinking of disciplines as a result of fissures in orders of knowledge within fields predating the so-called new studies. The year 2019 marked the 50th anniversary of black studies, or re referred to initially at Williams College as Afro-American studies, and now Africana uh, studies. So if you uh, all can see on the screen, uh, this is an image, um, uh, one of the photos that was taken uh, by uh, three uh, of three of the students uh, who uh, during the occupation of uh, Hopkins Hall, uh, in which students ended up uh, uh, locking the doors of Hopkins Hall, uh, where I, I, I like to call, though the administration might not like it, uh, where the Illuminati are, uh, are, right? Hopkins Hall, if you recall. Uh, where the president, the provost, dean of the, uh, dean of the faculty, uh, financial aid, study abroad, all in this building uh, with, um, uh, with one objective among a series of demands, but one of those objectives was that the year before in 1968, the administration had legislated the inauguration of what was then Afro-American studies, but gave no faculty positions, no resources to that. Uh, and students were making uh, demands that very much echoed the first Black Studies uh, department uh, and program at San Francisco State uh, College also um, at that same exact moment. The second image, uh, Williams was not co-educational uh, in 1969, but nonetheless there were transfer uh, students uh, who were allowed at the time. And so outside, this is an image outside of Hopkins Hall uh, at that same period during, uh, during the occupation. The institutionalization of Black Studies at Williams is greatly due to student demands issued in the wake of the assassination of Martin Luther King Jr. and the student takeover of Hopkins Hall the next year. And its creation mirrors uh, the founding of similar Black Studies programs, centers, and institutes throughout the country and later the globe. Among the founding imperatives of Black Studies are the forging and expansion not only of the field itself, but also the call to responsibility of other fields, including political science and the humanities, different fields in the social sciences and physical and natural sciences to rethink bodies of knowledge uh, taught in their, own, uh, in their own disciplines. So what am I suggesting? I'm suggesting on the one hand, that if we think about trying to talk about what does radical or radicalism or radicalizing mean and pose the stakes uh, of explaining them first in the abstract uh, and the relation to the phenomenology of blackness on the one hand. Second, the connection of these terms to the idea of revolution. Third, the struggle to realize the human that these activists and students, these student activists were uh, engaging in, in the language of Sylvia Winter. And fourth, the ways that the black radical tradition understood whether as homogeneous or heterogeneous endeavors to reconcile tradition on the one hand, and radical on the other. So while at first, while tradition connotes heritage, preservation, durability, and stability, radical implies either to the far right or far left of center, a break with the status quo, the spirit of the new, a beginning, a new beginning, and our natality in that archetypal word of Hannah Arendt. And so while not everything and all phenomena, not all of these are radical, some are. And in many regards, uh, we have to think through that. And in addition, I want us to try and think about what does it mean not only to so-called get free, but also live free. So briefly, before getting into what do we mean by freedom and its relationship to slavery, we must first ask a single short question. Why pessimism? Pessimism is a way of thinking that acknowledges human freedom and the ability to attain it, yet it questions the belief that the achievement of the free life itself shall solve many of our problems. We often conflate, and, and I conflate, and I've done this myself oftentimes, we often conflate pessimism with cynicism, skepticism, and nihilism. 
And this is a mistake. For instance, in the passage I began with by Ta-Nehisi Coates, a pessimist, it refers to ideas of his parents on the afterlife and metaphysics as skeptical. To be skeptical is to refrain from definitive judgment due to a lack of absolute knowledge. To be a nihilist is to arrive at a condition where you lose the desire for anything as a result of everyday strictures, not because of levels of our levels of knowledge. Pessimism expects nothing, writes Joshua Deinsteg. It is looking at, you know, I have my kind of, right? It's looking at, if you will, you know, the, the kind of looking at a half-filled glass and viewing it as half empty, right? Rather than half-filled, right? It's half empty. Um, but pessimism isn't merely doom and gloom to foreclose the possibility that our lives shall turn out well. Pessimism simply doesn't accept that our lives a priori will turn out positively. After all, the expectation that things will go badly is not on the surface any more or less rational than the expectation that things will go well. And as stated, pessimism is not nihilism. For nihilism would be wanting nothing, would not be wanting anything. And extreme nihilism, wanting nothing at all. Nihilism poses an even greater gravity than pessimism. In race matters, black strivings in a twilight civilization in his recent meditation on Dr. King's legacy, Cornel West underscores the severity in what West calls the nihilistic threat to black existence. That is the threat of having to cope with hopelessness, meaninglessness, lovelessness, right? That law, the beginning, how this, the opening began, that loss of a member of our community from class of 2010. Why is this happened, right? How do we cope with this? It's a, this nihilistic threat is a threat echoed in Kwabna Kugano's thoughts and sentiments on the evil of slavery and Anna Julia Cooper's A Voice from the South and Jamaica Kincaid's A Small Place, but it is also echoed in the polymath, the writing of polymath W.E.B. Du Bois. Du Bois states in the elegy of the tragic death of his firstborn son, Burgart, in the middle of this image, Burgart died four months shy of his second birthday. Du Bois wrote, within the veil was he born, said I, and there shall he live, a Negro and a Negro son. And of the future, Du Bois ponders in his work, Dusk of Dawn, what he calls the problem of the future world. And in his earlier, The Souls of Black Folk, what Du Bois called, and I'll say it slowly, a hope, not hopeless, but unhopeful in a land whose freedom is to us a mockery and whose liberty is a lie. However, Cornel West warns of a nihilistic threat in an age of pessimism, not the actual historical actualization of black nihilism. And as I mentioned, I'm not gonna read all of, all of what I had prepared, um, but there are some points I want, uh, I want us to make. We can talk about it in the question and answer if any was skipped over. A core goal of pessimism is to teach us how to live with what we cannot eradicate, the limitations of death and time in, with which the universe saddles us. Additionally, a core critique pessimism puts forth is the critique of progress. Pessimists reject aspirations to progress, understood in terms of incrementalism, civilizationism, human development, forward movement towards a new future social and political orders and or the desired return to a previous social and political order uh, following a period of structural retrenchment. So think, for instance, after the demise of Reconstruction in the US, and I would suggest um, arguably our current geopolitical moment. And furthermore, genres of pessimism deny the significance of and routinely the very ability of humans for slave agency. That is the inherent ability and the capacity for all humans to imagine freedom and how to live free individually or collectively. And also the inherent capacity of slaves like all humans for living, for action more broadly and more narrowly their imagined freedom ideal. Last opening points to the history of the word. The word pessimism derives from the Latin pessimismus, meaning the worst and the French, French pessimisme. And it came into language in the 18th century, ironically, shortly before the American, French, and Haitian revolutions that would transform the modern period. 
According to the Oxford English Dictionary, pessimism is the character or quality of being the worst, the condition, poss the condition possible or imaginable, the state of greatest deterioration, and the doctrine or belief that the actual world is the worst of all possible worlds. And you all know that person in your family or that friend or that person who you, colleagues who you work with or who you know who seem to always want to think about the worst right, in the world. But more seriously, pessimism was employed originally in Western thought to describe a position fundamentally in contrast to the concept of optimism advanced by the mathematician Leibniz in his 1710 treatise, Theodicy. For Leibniz, optimism is the outlook that, quote, the actual world is the best of all possible worlds. Voltaire in 1759, in his work, uh, Candidate or Optimism, popularized the term pessimism in the course of its trenchant rebuke of the very concept. It facilitated simultaneously the emergence of the English word optimism and the first use of pessimism, mainly by Catholic Jesuits, to criticize Voltaire's opinions. It's telling, it's important on dates here, it's telling that the French Academy admit, admitted its equivalent of optimism in 1762, the year that Jean-Jacques Rousseau published Of the Social Contract and Emile, but did not admit its contrasting term pessimism until 1878. Put differently, the, Academy event, the Academy's eventual acknowledgement of the latter more than a century later reflected the proliferation of genres of pessimism that mutated following the age of revolution in three key intellectual eras and movements. The first, late to mid 20th century European thought. The second, across the Atlantic, post-World War II realpolitik and realist international relations. And third, early 20 and 21st century black critical theory in the African diaspora. So I'm gonna skip over um, a lot of the written text, but to get us on the same page, what do we mean by the first? The first notion of, of pessimism, the first, the first genre in which efforts to explain decay, decline, truth, and value in light of the absurd anchor this first wave. This is the wave in which, if we all remember the myth of Sisyphus, what was the myth of Sisyphus that writers like Albert Camus talked about, where Sisyphus was banished to push a rock up the hill, and once the rock got all the way to the top, then what happened, right? And no, you know, right, the rock then went all the way back down, right? Right when we're at the precipice of what we imagine we want to do, um, things seem to kind of fall apart and go back down. In some sense, this creates this kind of an existential kind of realism and resentment and the shift, what Friedrich Nietzsche called the shift between the dimensions between master morality and slave morality, and how do we actually try and get out of this? The second type in international relations, and particularly realist international relations, thinking about on the one hand, in great power politics, in which oftentimes states, not people, not individuals, are the main object of analysis. I, I kind of liken this to watching Meet the Press every week, right? Meet the Press, you have different experts, different backgrounds, uh, but in the end, it almost seems like there, this inevitable kind of retrenchment because the belief of thinking about our, uh, our lot in life and our decisions is on rational grounds, kind of rationalist grounds, but, and that it's fixed, that is most importantly, real as international relations understands many of these attributes in our political world as, and global politics as fixed permanent features of human social and political orders, especially the natural anarchy of states and states thirst for power uh, and for wanting to maintain it. However, from the the 20th century, it is safe to say, has made all of us into deep historical pessimists, writes Francis Fukuyama. And yet the revenge of history shall undo the pessimism of realism, as Fukuyama not only mischaracterized the end of history, but also he was correct that a lot of times history um, makes us uh, attentive to alternative worlds. And in addition, as the great late Nobel laureate Toni Morrison observes in The Source of Self-Regard, Morrison writes, our past is bleak, our future is dim, but I am not reasonable. A reasonable woman or man, Morrison writes, must adjust to his or her environment or their environment. And the unreasonable uh, individual does not. All progress depends on the unreasonable person. That is, how do we explain phenomena 
that can't be understood in rational grounds. How do we explain to the slave uh, or the afterlives of slavery or individuals for whom logic and reason should say your life means nothing? It doesn't matter. And there's nothing you can do about it. Perhaps though, we need to tap into some other archives. The third, which I wanna say a little bit more about, the third genre I'm calling the genres of pessimism is the movement of Afro-pessimism, one of the most discussed contemporary uh, intellectual movements. And while the term initially pertained to disparaging Western portrayals of underdevelopment in post-colonial Africa and origins of its current usage in black critical theory in the halls of academe in California in particular, its vocabulary and positions are increasingly commonplace in everyday language. Afro-pessimism examines race, blackness, anti-black racism, fugitivity, the intersections of gender and race, flesh, body politics, and the figure of the slave, topics often absent commentaries in those previous two genres of pessimism that I mentioned. So let's get more familiar with individuals. There are the self-identifying Afro-pessimists, such as Frank Wilderson III, whose most recent book is a finalist for the National Book Award, and also Jared Sexton. There are scholars um, whose works others identify as Afro-pessimists, including Hortense Spillers, Ta-Nehisi Coates, Ashila Mbembe, and Saidiya Hartman. And there are those who reject the label in spite outright, in spite of those who attribute it to them, individuals such as Lewis Gordon and Sylvia Winter. And incidentally, it's Saidiya Hartman who actually uh, gave uh, the term to Wilderson uh, that then became popularized. And now I hesitate to say there's a debate between Afro-pessimists and Black optimists because there often ends up being only one Black optimist who comes into this discussion, which is Fred Moten, who then talks about Black optimism or what he calls Black ops for short, which is duly Black optimism and Black optimism. That is the one versus the many. But nonetheless, Moten is, does talk about what does it mean, as Hegel said, to get from here to there? What do we have to do? What types of movements or thinking otherwise do we need to, to understand? But more specifically, rather than emphasize life and living, Afro-pessimism in its different articulations preoccupies itself with death and the relationships among death, blackness, black being, and humanity. Calvin Warren, for instance, when he writes black being, he actually puts a, a line through, you know, he puts a line through the word being. It's as if black people are not even beings as well. And Afro-pessimists of different varieties talk about the fungibility of blackness, the ruse of analogy, and the unbreakable chasm between being human and blackness. Put simply, that to be human and to be black, it's like oil and water. These, for many Afro-pessimists, are inseparable categories. Now, let's review. If the natural anarchy of states is a permanent fixture in international realist international relations, then I'm suggesting that for Afro-pessimists, anti-blackness is their transcendental. That is, anti-blackness for Afro-pessimists is the fundamental attribute, fundamental attribute in the human of the modern condition in modern settler colonial states like the United States and South Africa, but especially in the United States. And therefore, we don't get out of anti-blackness. We don't get out of the murders uh, of, of black, young black uh, women, men, uh, children, adults, and others. We don't escape it. We basically have to mitigate it, the symptoms. Um, and last but not least, Afro-pessimists build upon a notion that the Harvard sociologist Orlando Patterson calls social death, in which Patterson says the conditions of powerlessness, dishonor and natal alienation, meaning being alienated from oneself by birth, create the condition of the socially dead. In my interpretation, this is the living zombie, that, that slaves across time are living zombies. And this is why Patterson in the book on the screen spends so much time talking about manumission, that is individuals who have had their, their status as free uh, purchase in monetary terms. And one of the things that Afro, the figure that Afro pessimists come back to the most is the Martinican figure, Franz Fanon. And particularly if you're gonna read a book by 
Franz Fanon, his 1952 book, Black Skin, White Mass. But this is a fundamentally not what Fanon argued. Socially dead, the idea of social death suggests that only so-called the free or those in power, you guys follow? Those in power can only enable those who are enslaved uh, to become free. Well, first of all, who, who, which individuals who have power, the 1% of the 1%, who wants to give that up? But even if so, that assumes that slaves had never have had a capacity for action. And Fanon said something very different. He said in the first couple of paragraphs of Black Skin, White Mass, he said, there is a zone of non-being, an extraordinarily sterile and arid region, an incline stripped bare of every essential from which a new departure can emerge. What Fanon meant, the individual and the terms uh, mean less than what I want to get across to you. Fanon said that like Dante's circles of hell, right, right in his trilogy, Dante like being guided by the angel Gabriel, Fanon was saying in the context of colonial Martinique, and the mid 20th century, the height, of, uh, the height of the colonial period, Fanon is saying that ironically by being thrust into a hellish condition, it actually allows slaves past, present, and in the future to realize who she, he, they are in order to then be able to come to an awareness of who we are. And once we come to an awareness of who we are, it allows us to realize that we always have had a capacity for action, however constrained. Now that is not a guarantee that we will be able to change the world to actually live and attain our vision of the free life, but it is the first major step. So in other words, the zone of non-being is different than the idea of social, uh, idea of social death. But the question becomes, as Angela Davis uh, has, has put forward, how do we know when we are free? So I promise, I mentioned a lot, but I'm gonna have a graphic that hopefully will bring it all together because I know we're almost time, time to, we're gonna, uh, in 10 minutes to have a conversation. There have been two traditional ways of thinking about freedom, particularly in the Western tradition. One, we can call the negative notions of freedom. The second, positive notions of freedom. Negative and positive are not ethical relations. It's not good or bad. Negative notions of freedom, such as non-interference and non-domination. Uh, thinking about freedom as the absence of wanting some other coercive agent interfering in my life arbitrarily or, uh, or, or non-arbitrarily and, and not wanting to be dominated. And then positive notions of freedom such as autonomy and plurality and generality. The first talks about the world we don't want to live in. The second talks about the world we want to envision, but there is this chasm in between. And also both those two traditions uh, still nonetheless assume that whatever freedom and unfreedom are, they are fixed. But actually most of us, as Cornel West has said, you know, are, are, you know, the, 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 are in the funk, right? That, that most of us are in this liminal space in between. So if you, I like popular culture, so this might age myself, but the kind of the trilogy of movies, The Matrix, right? This is like being in the matrix and then realizing that ultimately once we get unplugged, right? Once we get unplugged, how do we realize not only the condition that we were all, this, this is perhaps my, my controversial contribution, that we, I suggest we are all born slaves. And therefore, uh, ultimately the question is, how do we get free and live free? And that is where one single term that I want you to remember, marinage, M-A-R-R-O-N-A-G-E, that has different spellings. It's a French word that has the effect of a noun, and it means flight. In the in the, in the so-called New World, in the island of Hispaniola, contemporary Haiti and the Dominican Republic. Initially, the term that marinage comes from referred to Spanish feral cattle that then went up into the hills, and then subsequently to enslaved indigenous populations that wanted to escape plantation slavery. And then by the 1530 to enslaved Africans brought forcibly to the New World, uh, to Hispaniola, who then is took flight into the hills, into the marshes and the swamps to create autonomous, uh, autonomous communities. Historically, there have been a couple versions of marinage in the legal registers and also, um, and also uh, in documents and in writings. The first, petite marinage. Petite marinage just means individual marinage. So you see an image of Frederick Douglass right behind me. So when reading about Frederick Douglass's narrative of, of taking flight from Maryland Eastern Shore, 
Petite Marinage were individuals who either tried to run away from a plantation because of the um, because of either wanting a few hours of uh, of su mental sustenance, or trying to see a loved one to another on another plantation, or to steal away for some hours to then try and plan one's escape. On the one hand, and then um, and then this the, and so individual escape. The second Grand Marinage, which were collective communities that individuals didn't believe necessarily in their lifetime or ever that the regime of, of slavery would ever end. So it would be like the collect, a large collectivity in mass going into some autonomous territorially bound space to create a free, uh, to create a territorially bound society. Now there are real prob there are benefits and problems with both of those. But here's what I want you to all, this is the image. I said, I got one image for today um, that I want you to peer into. Um, I want to suggest just think with me. What if freedom across time is the flight from different forms of enslavement? Whether, and I'm going to just use my air, these are meant to be androgynous figures. So petite grand mind, that this is the first one I talked about, individuals running away. Or these collective territorially bound territories within a larger state or society. But what if freedom can also be understood as a macro political level as either um, this is the only time you'll hear me say trickle down. I call what's called sociogenic marinage at the top, uh, trickle down freedom. The idea that whether it's through a deity or deities or a sovereign political leader, or, uh, a political figure, for instance, a political leader, the idea that our collective freedom goes down from up top, filters down from the, the top to the bottom. And then the last building on Fennel, sociogenic marinage from the bottom up. What does it mean to actually transform the society all the way from the bottom, uh, from the bottom uh, up? Uh, and we see this with the movement for black lives. We see this with that response to Audre Lorde for those who have the attempt to euthanize and to, to, uh, to eradicate people who are still living and they're still fighting. And they are still committed to the belief that not only can we get free out of that zone of non-being, but actual living. And I, I can explain the arrows in the, in the Q&A, but ultimately we can still build a society, but that doesn't mean we are necessarily going to be able to sustain it. But from the, from the bottom up, not just the top down, what does it mean when all of these visions are, are occurring at once and what does it mean particularly for those committed, especially with the kind of theme for today and also what's happening, especially the movements for racial justice, against racial injustice, uh, to think about these different junctures in time in which there have been understandable pessimism that, uh, that may question whether or not we can do what we can do. The movement for black lives has given new energy to that belief that progress is possible, to that belief that in spite of these different forms of pessimism that our world can happen otherwise. And also the movement for black lives has underscored uh, the idea that progress is not just linear time. Sometimes we build and then there's retrenchments. Sometimes we go, the clock goes backwards, but then we persevere because if we believe against the idea of social death, if we believe that fundamentally we ha all have had the capacity for action, then that means that we have to be in it for the long durée, both individually, but also as a society. The Ferguson uprisings were really an indication at a certain point with Michael Brown's body, Mike Brown's body lived just in, in the street in the middle of the day, people just walking by just walking by while this young black man's body was in the street. The uprisings to Ferguson um, initially seemed like it was a catalyst, um, but then Ferguson was not necessarily in the news after a certain period of time. This image from those recall from Baton Rouge, Louisiana from July, 2016, uh, and what I, have been particularly captivated by this was not merely the image of this protester with a phalanx of officers. And notice the vantage point 
uh, is actually through. It's not at any one officer, it's a straight vantage point. But what do we make of the individuals who took the pictures? Right? In other words, because a lot of times when people think about kind of rev revolution or changes in a status quo or an order, they oftentimes think of macro politics and massive movements of people together. But what does it mean even to take an image in the social media age? And that even taking this photo, <coughs> excuse me, had a certain type of important effect that we shouldn't minimize. With the resurgence of the movement for black lives, this image that will be familiar to many, <coughs> in the debate about monuments and statues, that has been one that is still within the Williams College community, and even on campuses. Do you have monuments and statues and relics of a particular, a previous social and political order that may be the values of a current community, not all, that is not shared by all? Do you keep those statues? Do you keep those monuments, particularly when they are bound up in a connection to anti-Black racism, or do we change the order? Do we, or in this, the Robert E. Lee statue where the image of the Robert E. Lee statue was then a hologram of George Floyd um, was projected onto it in addition to different um, writings that have been put on the monument. Do you, do you keep the monuments? Do you get them away? Do you tear them down? Uh, or do we call attention to these monuments? In South Africa, the roads must fall and the Fees must fall movement. In Hong Kong, where there's not only questions about the relationship between Hong Kong to states such as the United States, but also Hong Kong vis-a-vis -vis kind of mainland China and individuals staking their lives, not only to get free, but to live free. And then last but not least, <clears throat> Michelle Alexander's The New Jim Crow, which it has come to my attention that I believe many alumni have either read or been reading, in which Professor Alexander suggests that the carceral state, the prison industrial complex that one sees when we think of those peaks and troughs after 1865 of the end of the Civil War in the US in which many associated emancipation with freedom, um, but at the same time, the social and political order realigned. And then with the rise and fall of reconstruction, we get the emergence of the convict lease system and then the progenitor to the modern prison uh, industry and the prison industrial complex of which black and brown women and men in particular uh, are overrepresented uh, in relation to their population. Alexander wants to suggest that this is a version of a new Jim Crow, a new type of legal and juridical code. Uh, and then when we're thinking about not only individuals who may be locked up, but also when individuals uh, exit their formal locked up status, what does it mean even to the question of the vote? Do you have the franchise? In the case of Florida, if you have the franchise, do you have to pay back, all right, back fines even to then be able to um, vote in a general election? Can one even vote at all? Um, what does this all mean? I wanna really shift to kind of questions, um, but I want us to suggest that living, ultimately life, ultimately visions of hope, ultimately action, the capacity of action that we all have had inherently, and more narrowly in our moment, um, there is, is, this is an election period. This is a period where there's been so much loss. There's been so much black pain. There's been so much pain and suffering in the wake of the pandemic that is still ravaging, uh, raging and ravaging. The inability for people to hug, shake, hand, shake hands, to see one another, even in Williamstown. Um, but um, we have faced despair before, and the question becomes, what are each of us going to do? 
Uh, and so I want to end there. Thank you for bearing with me. I realize some of that, um, if we had more time, I would, I would kind of explain in greater detail, but I'm more interested now in our remaining time uh, hearing questions from you all. And, um, and so I'm going to end the screen share and then we can hopefully kind of field some questions, if, that sound, if that's agreeable to everyone. Thank you for listening. Okay. Um, so I'm going to looking at the question and answer. And so if, um, and so hopefully if the question and answer uh, icon is there, feel free to add any questions that you may have and I'll try and answer them in the time we have to, uh, in the time to have together. Um, and so let me just uh, open this here. Uh, uh, I have a, there is a question. <clears throat> Uh, here in which uh, by Sarah, and excuse if I'm, I'm mispronouncing, but I'll try and pronounce everyone's name uh, uh, properly, uh, by Sarah Wilson, who writes, uh, in light of your discussion of the history of Afro-American studies program at Williams, I wanted to remember deceased professor Melvin Dixon, an English professor, poet, and theorist, and a mentor who supported my independent creation of a women's studies major through the college's contract major program. I believe it was the first major in the late 1970s. And here's the question. How does the pessimism or anti-black theory uniquely impact black women. Is there an intersectionality angle? It is a wonderful, uh, it is a wonderful question. Um, and I would answer it uh, a couple ways. One, thank you for calling attention to an important troubadour who really laid the groundwork for the work of myself and everyone else in their, uh, in their wake and also your work, work for creating um, the, uh, uh, the model for what is now women's gender and sexuality study. Um, if one understands intersectionality as an idea of thinking about the identities that shape each of us. So uh, the legal scholar Kimberly Crenshaw, who coined it, the term in the late 80s, 1980s in an article, before the late 1980s, individuals, if one was the subject, for instance, of what we'd now call a, a kind of a hate crime that involved the, the race, gender, sexuality, ability, age, um, uh, of multiple identifications of an individual before a certain period of time, legally, one could only sue based upon one of those vectors. And Kimberly Crenshaw, going back to black feminist thinkers, such as Anna Julia Cooper and Ida B. Wells said, that's nonsense. Um, each of us is made up of multiple identities. That's what makes us human. And so therefore, if one is to talk about anti-black, uh, anti-blackness, and also even the struggle to try and become and live free in the wake of that, then I would say not just in terms of genres of pessimism, but especially um, in terms of just thinking about not only what is pessimism, but also what does it mean to be free? We have to take into the consideration that um, we each experience the world uniquely. And so I would say absolutely that we have to think about the ways in which these vectors, um, that these vectors not only intersect, but also how does that um, connect to strategies for imagining the world. And I think it's not, it's not incidental that the movement for Black Lives and the phrase Black Lives Matter were coined by queer, by queer Black women. And we must honor that and we must respect that and we must not disavow that um, and we must learn from that as we think about these responses um, uh, of what we can do. So thank you um, for, that, uh, for that question. Um, there are two that I think I would put together um, one by Cindy uh, Tether that says, in Jamaica, the Maroons uh, escaped to the mountains to avoid being enslaved. And for Pierce Hammond, by Pierce Hammond, what about spiritual Maroonism based on the belief that, uh, of God in every, uh, that God is in everyone? Um, I, would answer it, uh, I would answer it this way, which is that, um, <clears throat> that in the Jamaican context, one of the both kind of amazing phenomena and also the kind of tricky history that a lot of the time gets unavoided is that absolutely Jamaica was one of the kind of states in which um, Maranage and, uh, and different kind of grand, Maroon, grand Maranage communities that collectivities had different kind of pockets of autonomy with it running away from the plantation. However, one of the phenomenon of Grand Maranage over time were that colonial powers would try and invade a Maroon space and get repelled, invade, repelled, invade, repelled, and then ultimately Treaties were signed. And many of those treaties said, if we will, that is we colonial power will no longer invade your territorially bound maroon space unless you turn, as long as you turn over any new fugitives. 
Um, uh, no, if you don't have a hard stop, you can do press. Uh, yes, and I'm also realizing that this is, we might be over uh, near time, but I, please, for those of you who want to stay, I'm going to stay. So if you need to go, go, but hopefully alumni relations <laughs> won't cut me off um, because I really want to answer your questions. Um, ultimately, these Grand Marinage, many of these communities, including Jamaica, signed treaties that said, we, you must turn over any new runaways um, uh, so that we will no longer invade your space. So that between the Haitian Revolution that ended in 1804 and the Cuban Revolution that ended in 1959, the one Caribbean territory that was closest to a social, formal social and political revolution was Jamaica in 1865. And that uprising, the Morant Bay Rebellion, was killed because Maroons turned over one of the two main leaders who then got executed uh, and it was done. Uh, so there is a kind of qualified freedom, but it's still important nonetheless, especially because of the spiritual significance, which I take, which is Pierce Hammond's question. And so if we think of what I didn't get to get to is that if we think of not just marinage, but freedom more generally in multiple valences, physical, which is oftentimes, and legal, physical and legal are usually the two valences of, of thinking about freedom. But I would introduce not only the psychological, and that's where Fanon was important, but also the metaphysical, which is, I take it, the spiritual dimension. What does it mean to, and Harriet Jacobs, we see this in her loophole of retreat, where for those years where Jacob was literally in the attic of her grandmother, um, she peered out once a day, a hole. She peered out a tiny hole to see her children, because she knew if she acknowledged that she was alive and hadn't run away, they would kill her children. And every day that her children were alive, and she's looking in this tiny confined space out of the window, she's realizing that that, that freedom for, for Jacobs was also about a cognitive and a spiritual condition. So both of those, um, uh, both of those are really, really, really um, important. Um, let me look at some of these questions. Um, a couple. Uh, so by Catherine um, Fitzgibbons, what is your advice to people to help them live freely today in our age of pessimism? Why not give up when you see continued actions by the police that violate human rights but are not punished? Um, is the idea to hang on to knowledge that you've always have the ability to make choices and choose actions in your own life despite my circumstances? Folks tried to kill my ancestors. Lots of folks tried to kill my, actually, that, that's past tense. There are folks in real time and who are arms of the state who are trying to kill um, people who look like me. And that's real. If we don't acknowledge that, and why I, be, I wanted us to begin to take a moment to talk about Brianna Taylor, then we're living, we're not being true to the realities. But why I have to have, um, uh, I, I'm not calling it optimism, but why I have to have um, hope and why I think we should have hope is to be able to realize that there are different junctures in which it, we were very near the period in which it was um, it, these different moments in which it was understandable um, that we should give up. But, um, but we've, we've fought and we have, we, we have had periods of progress and I, and I, and I believe in it and I, I'd encourage all of you to believe in it. Um, because of the time, I'm gonna just take a bundle of questions. I won't read them out, but I'll put a kind of a bundle of questions um, that are really dealing with not only what we can do, but also what, what steps we can take. So Christine, Tamir uh, was also was presenting um, the what do we what do says what do I think are strong reliable preventative measures against this nihilistic threat to black existence with some others uh, some other questions Lizzie Jacobs um, also asking what can be taken in terms of political spaces in terms of um, uh, also what activities of optimism versus activities of pessimism. The first thing we need to do is to dispel the idea that we either live in a, th that we should either be pessimistic or optimist. Rather, as you can probably tell right now, the great Martinique, the late Martinican thinker, Edward Glissant, had what he called this idea of the poetics of relation. For Glissant, we are always in a relationship. There are not polarities, there are not chasms. We're always intertwined with one another, whether we like it or not. So if we're entwined with one another, whether we like it or not, there are moments in which, I won't say it's a doom and gloom, but there are moments in which our efforts don't necessarily kind of materialize. But those are not the reasons to, um, to uh, not fight the effort. And there are there's very specific, in terms of the question of political measures, we're in an election year. For those who are eligible to vote, vote. 
there isn't there is a pessimism around the idea that does voting matter no there are people who struggled too long and hard for the right to be able to vote um to for that to be squandered if one is not even a citizen within a state that one is living in and is is not eligible to vote that individual or individuals can still enable others uh in terms of uh political literacy CLR James, uh, and you can even search this online, the Trinidadian thinker wrote a pamphlet uh, in the wake of the Hungarian revolution in 1956 called Every Cook Can Govern. And then after this, I think I'll have to turn it over to our moderator. But James wrote a pamphlet called Every Cook Can Govern. It ostensibly was a pamphlet reflecting on ancient Greek democracy. But what was interesting is that James said a couple of things. He says a lot of people who talk about democracy in ancient Greece seem to be concerned about the institution of slavery and not the slaves. But he also said, all of us are political cooks. Every one of us has the ability to contribute to the political processes that can then um, uh, uh, change our society. For some that's being on the picket lines, for others that's teaching, for some that is being, especially in the pandemic, a healthcare worker. For others, it's your studies, right? And for others, it's also, as the Black Lives Matter movement has talked about, right, self-care. For sometimes we have to, <laughs> you know, someone wants you to do stuff, maybe, the day, the week, maybe it's not time to take on duties that you would usually do because we have to have a sense of self and regain that sense of self if it's lost. And that is the complexity of living. I'm over time, but thank you all. I know I didn't get to all of the questions, but hopefully at least some of that was, was useful. And I saw some uh, alums who I had the pl pleasure of being able to teach uh, and others who I am getting to know, but I just really would like to say thank you and uh, and I'm going to turn it back to um, the New York chapters uh, president to um, close out the, the session. Thank you so much, Professor Roberts. Thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to um, share your thoughts on such an important topic and at such a uh, important time um, and to engage us in this thought provoking discussion. Just as a reminder to everyone, this lecture, as well as the other lectures in this series, can be found at alumni.williams.edu slash virtual. You can also find other Williams offerings there as well. And again, please keep an eye out for upcoming virtual Williams events and activities. Um, just to end, um, to share again a personal note, I've just listed some resources I'm voting here in New York City. There's a, a website called whosontheballot.org. You can go there, put your address in. It will take you to who will be on the ballot for you based on your party, your address, your district, and it will also link to those candidates' campaign sites so you can be informed when you go to vote. I've also listed the website 866 Our Vote, which is a more national focused voting website for voter registration information um issues with voting voter suppression etc if you have resources that you know of these are just two please share them in the chat share them now and i've also listed um the morning and the new york times today gave um gives a synopsis of a lot of resources on voting so i listed that link there as well um so again thank you so much for joining us today I wish you all well, I wish you safety, and I wish you all the best as we grapple with and move through this time. Please vote. Thank you all. Take care. Thank you.